Okay, here. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Cavey. I'm the host of the Teachers on Fire podcast. So glad to be chatting for a few minutes this morning. Don't want to take too much of your day, but uh, I wanted to set up a weekly chat with other educators, sort of a, a state of education, if you will. So um, why don't we go ahead and start by introducing ourselves. Um, Chanel, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us about your context in education. All right, well, good morning, Tim, JT, Brandon, and the world. My name is Chanel Johnson, and I am in 11 years in education. Oh, good morning, Eric. And I am a science specialist. I recently just transitioned to a new district. So imagine trying to develop relationships with teachers, students, and principals virtually in a new district. <laughs> wow. All right, well, welcome Chanel. Brandon, tell us about you and, and what your context in education looks like. Hey, how's everybody doing? So my name is Brandon Beck. I am a fifth grade monolingual dual language te teacher, if you can figure that out. Um, and I'm also a uh, upcoming author with Code Breaker with a book that's going to be released in November called Unlocking Unlimited Potential. I wear many hats in education. Primarily, I am a teacher, but by day and by night, I am a certified instructor for the United States Soccer Federation. So I'm also a soccer coach as well. Interesting. And JT, I'm new to you. Thank you, Chanel, for uh, bringing along JT. JT, tell us about who you are and what your context in education looks like. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Tim, Chanel, Brandon, and Eric. Um, yeah, I am an educational consultant. I'm a full-time edu educational consultant at Purpose Pushers LLC. Um, I have 13 years uh, in education. I served as a special education teacher with students who have emotional disabilities for a decade. Um, and then I, I was a Title I instructional coach for uh, two years. And now I'm currently working with schools and, and divisions um, to help them implement SEL and culturally responsive teaching practices. And hey, uh, GT, SEL has never been more important, right? So uh, that's an important uh, niche to be in. And Eric, I happen to know you because you're a colleague, but tell everyone else about your context and your grade levels, what that looks like for you. Uh, so I am going into my eighth year of full-time teaching, um, and uh, I am a math teacher for high school, secondary, um, grades 9 to 12, and um, I work at an independent faith-based school, um, and I'm the mathematics department head. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for hanging out for a few minutes this morning. Uh, pretty loose agenda here. We can take this in a lot of different directions, but... Uh, at top of mind, I've spent the last two weeks really planning like crazy for the start of school. So I would love to hear for each of you uh, what that looks like in your schools and districts. Um, Chanel, let's go back to you. What does the start of school look like? Are we looking at remote, hybrid, face-to-face? -face? What, what's that going to be? Well, we've been in school for three weeks now. And oh, wow. <laughs> We are totally remote, we're virtual, and right now it's been a lot of trial and error, and it's been a lot of, hey, let's just make sure we learn how to use the devices. It's been a lot of planning, replanning, let's try it again. This didn't work today, it's okay. It's been a lot of that. Um, but we're starting to get in the groove of things now where you're really starting to see some actual instruction going on, but those first three, these first three weeks, it has not been that. <laughs> it has not, it's literally been what we've been saying those first two weeks of school where we need to be developing relationships and we need to be getting protocols in place. That has been what these three weeks have been doing. And I actually think we can go for a good four weeks of just planning that and that only. Wow. And I might be coming back to you, Chanel, for some insights. You're three weeks into it. And those teachers starting in 100% virtual, I think, face a really big challenge in terms of building those relationships right uh brandon what are things looking like in your world and i i know you're not immediately in a school at the moment do i have that right uh brandon are you hearing me oh okay brandon might be having an issue with his connection yeah i'm back sorry oh. internet connection <laughs> yeah no worries i'm back i'm here 
Um, so I was just asking, I, I don't think you're in the classroom or in a school at the moment. Do I have that right? <laughs> okay, he's, his connection right. is, is not great. JT, uh, you, I, as I recall, you're a consultant. What does the return look like in your school or district? Yeah, every district that I'm working with is completely virtual. Um, no hybrid, wow. not, not back in school, at least for the first semester. Um, so everyone is planning on how to engage students in rigorous instruction through a virtual platform. Um, and of course, as, as Chanel alluded to, the learning curve and, you know, trying to figure out the best way to do it is where everyone is right now in the planning uh, section, uh, in the planning set stage of it. But, but most of the, the administrators that I've worked with, their commitment really for this year has been family engagement. Um, they're really trying to support parents because they know, uh, of course, this is stressful for every educator and every student. But it is it is, you know, even more stressful for the parents because a lot of the parents have a new role to embrace um, to, to create PBI in their living room, you know, and, and to support their students on technology that's that's unfamiliar to them. So um, kudos to all of the administrators who have taken that. Uh, that route of, of supporting parents. And so that's what everyone is doing right now. Wow. Wow. So I, I want to, just like I said with Chanel, I want to come back around and sort of unpack that a little bit further. But Eric, tell the viewers and, and our friends here about uh, what things are looking in the high, looking like in the high school. I, I think I have a sense of what that will look like, but I know you've been in some meetings this week. So uh, tell us about that. So, um, it will be sort of a hybrid model. Um, we've broken our, um, each grade is a separate cohort. So sort of they can, uh, those students are allowed to sort of mingle with each other, um, but they're not supposed to interact outside of those cohorts. Um, we are going to have um, the nines and tens in school on Mondays and Thursdays, and the 11s and 12s in school on Tuesdays and Fridays. On those opposite days, um, the they will be at home and they will be having some sort of um, online education, some lessons that they're supposed to work through or uh, like uh, videos that they can watch, video lessons that they can watch. Um, Wednesdays are days that are sort of um, flexible for them. They could be um, in designated areas in the school working on their own work or they could be at home. Um, that's my understanding of it. Uh, it's a chance for them to catch up or to see their teachers um, if they are were unsure about the parts that they were learning on their own at home, uh, that kind of thing. And then we're also running a quarter system. So they'll do two courses each quarter for a couple of weeks, um, more than a couple of weeks, but yeah. Um, and then we'll get through our entire year. That way, hopefully. <laughs> So kind of a complicated delivery, but yeah, yeah as, as Eric mentioned here in uh, British Columbia, we've been ordered to go full face-to-face -face return, but try to keep students in these groups so that if there are positive test cases, it, it hopefully doesn't spread through the entire school. And we heard about that school in Indiana that had to shut down, I think, four hours after starting or something. So that's certainly a possibility. So Chanel, let's come back to you and talk about three weeks into the school year in a virtual environment. Uh, your orientation is, is STEAM, but of course, SEL, really important as well, relationships. So what insights have you gathered from your team and your community in terms of what really works in terms of building relationships with kids? So it's so funny that you say that. One of the things that I wanna also highlight is social emotional learning is for all. And right. One of the things that we did for our department chair meeting, actually, the first thing I asked, how are you doing? But before I throw anything about science, anything about what the curriculum expectations are, how are you doing? Right. And, and you'll be surprised just how just that one question, you just get, be prepared for the answers you're going to get. And it's not always <laughs> going to be, oh, everything's just fine. Some people are really going to pour their hearts and you have to be prepared for what you're going to do with that information. Right. So keep that in mind. But um, just I went off on a tangent there. But say your question I one more. It. 
<laughs> well, no, I, I mean, you, you answered that. I'm just looking for what, I mean, you're, you're ahead of the rest of us, right? Or actually I need to check with JT and see how far you are into it. But um, yeah, insights. And I think what I hear from you is just letting people, letting kids, letting staff members have a voice right? And just share where they are. I, Chanel, I gave my, uh, my middle school team that opportunity yesterday and, or actually Thursday. And I was a little bit anxious about like, I don't want it to become this like really toxic vent session, <laughs> but I think it is really important on the other hand to allow teachers to have that opportunity to share their thoughts. Yeah. So even, um, just emailing them. Like I made yeah. a Google Classroom for all of my science department chairs. Because remember, I'm in a new district. These are new people that have to earn my trust. I mean, I have to earn their trust. Excuse me. Right. That came out wrong. But I have to earn their trust and let them know that, hey, I'm here next to you. I'm not here judging. I'm not. A, I'm none of those things. So I created that safe space. And even if you're not comfortable saying what you need to say in the classroom, I send emails. Mm. Hey, how are you doing? Some of these teachers, they have my phone number. Like where they just can call. So we have to be available to them and their needs. That's insight. Because if you're there to support them emotionally, support them, everything else will follow professionally, getting seeking that advice from you, the curriculum support that they, you know, may need. If you're supporting them emotionally at a time like this, everything else is going to fall in place. And that's what I'm noticing now that just being in this new role, hitting them where we need to be hitting them the most, everything falls into place. But the other insight I have is keep it simple. Yes, we have <laughs> curriculum we have to cover. Yes, they need to be on this grade level reading by this time. I get it, but no, not right now. Yeah. Not right now. Take it <laughs> slow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't, teachers, don't worry about content, covering every inch of content. And this is not the year to be concerned with that. Brandon, it looks like your connection is a little better. Tell us about you, the, the context, your community. What does the return to school look like where you are? Yeah, so I'm in a suburb outside of New York City. And so I consider myself kind of at the, the epicenter of the whole COVID cri crisis. And, right. in, in, you know, so it's, it's really been a lot of touch and go. I mean, and the perfect example is my school district. You know, for the past two months, we were all set to go and ready to rock and roll with the hybrid model kids coming in Monday and Tuesday, cleaning day on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, group B kind of thing. And about three days ago, we got the announcement that we're gonna push everything to starting off kind of 100% virtually. Teachers will be in the building and working to kind of plan that, but what they even did, and I actually had a lot of respect for it because it wasn't easy to do, is they pushed back and added some more staff development days so that we can all be prepared and on the same page. So, I mean, just kind of going along with what you, you said, Chanel, asking students how they're feeling and getting into those uncomfortable conversations is really what a lot of this is going to be about. And starting the school year is a lot different than ending the school year. What we did it back in March, April, and May is gonna be a lot different. You know, I'm a elementary teacher, so I have students that are in a, that are new to my classroom that I have never met before and they're new to my building. Mm -hmm. And so within about two weeks, they're gonna slowly transition. And the goal is for it to be a hybrid setting, desks, you know, six feet apart, 12 students. I see a lot of potential in that. I see, you know, I, I, there's a lot of, with all this time during COVID, there's a lot of opportunities for us to complain, for us to worry, for us to kind of get upset about what might happen. And right. really what we what might happen is really what we can control. And who's to say, you know, that this could be lead to some really great things down the line because at the end of the day, this is what we're doing and this is where we're going. So that's just kind of where we are and and you know just my encouragement and what I'm trying to really embrace going forward into the school year is to not allow my mind to go to those places and really focus on what's best and what's right for students. And it may not be what we're used to doing each day with, you know, a 15 minute mini lesson, then 30 minutes of student work, then following up, throw that all out the window and let's just focus on really strong opportunities for learning. 
Amazing. I love what you said, Brandon, that there's no shortage of things to complain about right now. I mean, that's really true. You can, you know, we can insult our, all our government and district leaders, our administrators. <laughs> we can be mad about a lot of things right now, not to mention Jacob Blake and everything else going on in the background, right, for, uh, for our different communities across the continent. JT, what have things looked like in the return for you? And what are your insights? What are your strategies headed back? Yeah, so I'm in uh, the Hampton Roads area of Virginia. And so here, again, everyone is is full uh, virtual. Um, they consider the hybrid plan in a lot of places, but then they made up their mind and say, hey, we're just going to go 100% virtual for at least the, the first semester. And so along with uh, helping parents understand some of the educational jargon that we use, um, a lot of leaders are also trying to um, as Chanel alluded to, help their staff get acclimated with this new technology, with the new application. Um, and to Brandon's point, uh, a lot of people are learning some some new skills. So we got skill acquisition at an all time high. So there are some beautiful things coming out of this unfortunate situation. Um, but everyone is still trying to be grounded and, and centered around doing what's best for kids. Um, and so that does mean meeting the social emotional needs of learners and and I've seen some districts try to, you know, redefine their lesson plan template to make sure that they have a component for SEL integration, at least in the first uh, 10 or 15 minutes or at the last 10 or 15 minutes. And so those are some 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 real strategic things that are going on to, su to support students. But then again, um, you have to do that labor, that manual labor, because, you know, no educator can pour from an empty container. And so we as educators have to make sure that we are invested in ourselves to make sure that we are emotionally whole. Because back to Chanel's point, when you open that up to say, hey, how's everyone feeling? And a student really begins to express what's on their heart and what, they're been, what they've been struggling with. The educator has to know how to address that in such a way that it leaves everyone encouraged, opposed to everyone even more sad and anxious and depressed because of the bad news or the ill emotions that students are feeling. So educators have to really do that work to get a grasp of social emotional learning, as well as all of the issues that we're kind of witnessing all over uh, the nation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I love that line you dropped JT about educators can't pour from an empty cup, or I, I don't think I got that quite right, but just that idea that we really need, I mean, we say it all the time, but we don't do it. We're so, we're, we're terrible. We're terrible about taking care of ourselves. Um, it, it, Eric, in the hybrid model that you described in the high school, what, what are your thoughts about building relationships with kids and replacing or, or sort of just managing that relationship? It's going to be a little bit weird this year. Um, yeah, the one thing that I um, uh, find difficult uh, working in, um, in a high school is that uh, you know, teenagers are at this point where they want to be independent. They want to um, uh, do their own thing and that kind of thing. So, so getting them to, oh, sorry, but also they're they're sort of closing themselves off emotionally because they don't want to seem like they don't have it together. They don't want to seem uncool or anything like that, right? <laughs> right. Especially around their peers. So, um, it's difficult to get them to. Um, open up. It's difficult to get them to um, come and ask for help and that kind of a thing. Um, so I think just trying to make uh, the most of the time that we have together, encourage them um, to uh, be honest about it. Uh, you know, everybody's in the same situation here. Um, and so uh, if we're all open and honest with each other, I think that we can um, uh, find that we're all in the same place uh, and that uh, what you're experiencing or feeling is not um, unique um, that uh, there's somebody else that that is uh, feeling the same thing and you can actually um, get through this together um, as opposed to just trying to handle it on your own um, right. luckily we have um, at our school we call pastoral care groups so our homerooms are broken down into smaller subgroups um, and then uh, each teacher has a group of like six to 10 students that they'll be seeing regularly throughout the day, uh, throughout the year, like every day. Um, That's awesome. So hopefully that can be time that uh, we can use to um, break down some of those walls a little bit and, and, and uh, 
help and encourage our students? You know, my class last spring in virtual learning was 28 kids. And one thing we found is that uh, kids don't, they're not, they don't speak that freely. And I teach eighth graders. They don't speak that freely in a group of like 30 people in a Google Meet. But if you do bring it down into that small group, virtually or face-to-face, -face, um, kids can open up a little bit more, especially if they're with, uh, uh, you know, their friends, people they feel safe with. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to take too much of your time beyond 30 minutes. So I want to give at least one final round here to uh, a, an opportunity to talk about current projects. What is next for you? Uh, Brandon, you're releasing this book. I know that. And I want to hear more about Purpose Pushers, uh, find out what that is. Chanel, let's start with you, though. What is next in, in your, I guess, what have you got in your crosshairs? Uh, what's on your radar for this coming week and, and looking into the fall? Um, no current projects right now because at this point I'm focused on my new role, developing relationships with my teachers, supporting them in the areas of K-5 science. And that's really what I have going on. And also being a mom in virtual learning, managing my job. And I'm sure, you know, behind my back, you probably see my kids running because <laughs> I'm at home and having to manage that piece with yeah. the kids, with their virtual learning experience, you know, when to back off, when to support, because, you know, no one wants their, you know, we see the real struggles around kids at home when they're doing virtual learning, and you have to know when to just intervene and step back. Um, so I'm taking all of this, all of these experiences in and not taking anything for granted. One last thing just to even talk about, make sure everyone that you're teaching these kids basic tech tools split screen, copy paste, just because they can play Roblox, just because they can make dynamic TikTok videos, it does not mean they know how do you do the basic functions of technology. So that's what I'm working on right now, just taking all of this information in and how to share it and help people. Chanel, I, I feel like in the STEAM space, and I, I know STEAM is such a, a, a passion and a heartbeat for you. And I remember from our podcast interview, you talking about your dad's influence. Um, one opportunity, if, if we're going to think about silver linings of virtual learning, is that uh, families typically have uh, the kitchen available to them, right? Uh, which is kind of that, like, it can be a, a mini laboratory. So do you see, even in the, the virtual environments, an opportunity for teachers to still try some STEAM projects at home? Um, absolutely. And NFTA actually has a really good resource on how to conduct lab safety at home, because even still, we have to apply lab safety at right. home. And we can't be in there mixing chemicals and doing dangerous things and we definitely don't want teachers putting their house on fire and encouraging the students to do it so make sure we're applying lab safety but stem is definitely can they definitely can be applied at home and yeah you know go for it but be safe when you do oh right. i brought that up <laughs> <laughs> don't set the house on fire because your teacher told you to uh, Brent, Brandon, tell you, tell us about uh, unlocking unlimited potential. What's going on there? Yeah, absolutely. So the book has saved my life because it's given me something to focus on positively during this time. Um, it's been an incredible experience. The book is just about tapping into that potential that we have within all of us. And I can perfect example is we've all sat in those meetings and we've all sat in those times in our classroom where we've always sat there and thought, man, can I do this? Is this gonna work? Did I, do I, these self-limiting beliefs that we all have. Mm -hmm. And it's all about kind of encouraging ourself and unlocking that unlimited potential within us so that it becomes contagious upon our students. And it walks us through kind of that mindset of what that looks like. And I've been super excited and going back to what you just said, Tim, about silver linings, there's actually a chapter in the book I had to write about COVID. It's called When One Door Closes, A Virtual One Opens. And what I did is I collaborated with a bunch of different people who I never knew before COVID, just all my people from my Twitter PLN and, and from the Twitterverse. And I reached out to them and they wrote little submissions about what this experience has been like and how they've unlocked the limited potential in themselves and, and everybody around them during this time. And, you know, guys like Brian Aspinall, Jonathan Alshimer, uh, the Staff Room Podcast, or just a few of the names 
um, that are involved in that chapter. And so it's just been about embracing this opportunity. And I'm super excited to, to launch the book. The reason we pushed it back to November is that my wife is having our third little girl in October. So we had to wow. kind of make it work around all that craziness. So that's why it's coming out in November, but I'm really excited and, and just being able to meet people like all of you and, and, and being able to be in opportunities in places like this has been what has been super inspiring for me during this time. And I'm really excited to share this work with everybody. Well, I know uh, publishing a book is like delivering a baby a little bit. So congrats and <laughs> congratulations on, on both of those pregnancies. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, I, I love, Brandon, that you mentioned mindset because one of my passions is growth mindset. And this, uh, I, I love to challenge teachers about the labels and the boxes we put around ourselves, right? And mm -hmm. something you'll even hear from teachers is I'm not a tech person. I'm not a math person. I'm not a steam person, right, Chanel? And uh, we've got to think outside of boxes and say, we are all, all of those people. We're just maybe at different points on the continuum, mm -hmm. but the same way we would never label a kid and say, you know, you are just not a math person. I mean, can you imagine saying that to a kid? Uh, in the same way, we can't do that to ourselves. So I love that idea of, you know, unlimited potential. We don't know the, the end goal or pardon me, the end destination for any learner of any age. We, we just don't. And a lot and, of times, neither do they. Yeah, neither yeah. do they. Absolutely. Um, limit, uh, I, I want to say limitless. I might be mixing up th that up with a movie, but uh, Joe Bowler writes about this idea that, uh, have you got it there? <laughs> this oh, is that's another, another one. That's another one. Okay. Yeah. Great um, book. Just that idea that so many kids have been labeled and boxed over the years and uh, they've broken through those boxes. So very cool. Well, thanks for sharing about that. JT, tell us about Purpose Pushers. What's going on there? So Purpose Pushers, uh, it's, uh, it, it started as a student motivation uh, consulting company. I was working with school divisions to motivate students. And then um, I started presenting at conferences and then, of course, uh, principals and districts started reaching out to, for me to do staff uh, development. And so then that's what I focused on. But it's really about inspiring a uh, purpose. Um, so the, the mantra is build capacity and inspire purpose. I call it PD with a purpose. So it's more than uh, a one shot keynote. Um, hi, y'all. And, you know, and then we leave, you know, it's more so followed up with uh, job embedded coaching. Um, and so when when COVID hit, I still had to do everything virtual. So keynotes were virtual, coaching was virtual, and it actually transitioned very well. But the newest project that I have right now is Purpose Pushers Academy. Um, and so that is my virtual professional development um, platform. Um, and on that platform, educators can kind of customize um, their professional development plans for the year. And so again, uh, I have a special ed background, so I do a lot of training on specially designed instruction, co-teaching, culturally responsive teaching, um, equity um, and poverty. Um, and so on the, on the platform right now, I have six courses available that educators can enroll in or districts can enroll their, their staff in. And um, I'm, I'm, I have to put a new one up uh, this upcoming week called Hip Hop Pedagogy and Literacy. Yes. Um, that, that's going to be a, a nice one. I'll be presenting that at the annual middle level level educators virtual conference in October. So I'm going to take that same virtual uh, training and put it on Purpose Pushers Academy. Uh, so before the year is out, educators can have 10 courses to choose from. Um, and again, they can choose whatever they're passionate about or whatever they're curious about, because, again, it's got to be about building capacity. Um, and inspiring educators to do this work. I'm a big believer in self-efficacy. So how do we build efficacy? And it's through these type of experiences. It's about knowing our why, right, uh, JT? And, and when we know our why, we know our purpose. Man, that's the fire. That's the fire that just fuels us. Um, I'm now following you on Twitter. So I'm super Thanks. glad that Chanel connected us today. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, hey, and before I move on to Eric, JT, do you have a presence? Does Purpose Pushers have a presence on TikTok? Because I feel like hip hop pedagogy. I you mean, know, I, 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 I am a little slow on the TikTok uh, bandwagon. <laughs> I'm a little slow. I had one and then I didn't have one. And so I, I probably need to jump on that. 
but on my uh, YouTube channel, I do have a lot of uh, videos because when I was uh, at the high school, we actually did a few hip hop videos with the students um one is called meet me at the ted and it's hilarious because uh at, in our area the ted constant center is at old dominion university and that's where all of our districts around here will have their high school graduation and so it's the songs like meet me at the ted it's going down and so all of the kids that you know we're throwing that get graduation caps in the air so yeah, it's it's you know hip-hop ha is, has been a, a great um instructional tool for for literally decades it's just it hasn't really been mainstream yet it hasn't been grabbed by schools but now with this new push for culturally responsive teaching and knowing that uh hip-hop culture is actually youth culture young people there's not a young person in america who hasn't heard of old town road by Lil nas x or you know some of these uh, uh famous artists and so they are familiar with these artists and taking their work and using it as an instructional tool to teach English, to teach figurative language, metaphors, similes, and all of these different uh, things that they have to learn, these central skills that they have to know, it's a great way to build that, that bridge for kids to get excited about um, the learning uh, process. You are talking the language of another friend, uh, CJ Reynolds, Real Rap with Reynolds there in Philly. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but uh, do you, have you got a YouTube presence, JT? Oh, uh, not a big one. Not okay. a big one. <laughs> Working on that too. Very cool. Well, well, thanks for sharing and look forward to digging into uh, Purpose Pushers. Eric, I don't know if you, I, I know, or I don't feel like you are a content creator per se, but have you got, uh, what's what's on your mind as you head into the school year? Um, I, yeah, I don't have um, any big projects going on like, um, uh, some of these others, which is, and those are great projects. They sound uh, really interesting. Um, I've got a couple of small things. Um, I, I took a class this summer. Uh, like I said, I'm at a, a faith-based school. So I took a, a course on um, uh, incorporating uh, Christian worldview into uh, like the teaching, teaching practice. And uh, so I spent a bunch of the summer sort of thinking through how I was going to implement that. And now that's gone out the window. So I'll have to <laughs> rethink that. <laughs> um, but also, uh, I am uh, going to be, uh, I guess you could call it a tech coach for, uh, for my school um, yes. for the coming year. And um, one thing that I did uh, back in the spring was I made a bunch of um, instructional videos for the staff and a few for the students um, on how to use uh, Google Meet and some of the other tools that we were using. Um, because like Chanel said, um, kids know what they know even in high school they know what they know of technology and that's it and it's a lot less than you might think it is right. um and so D digital native does not mean digital expert exactly yes yeah totally and uh, I, yeah. I taught um it for a few years a couple years ago and um what i found is that um a lot of students view the computer as a magical box that does, you know, they can get their email, they know how to do that, and they can, you know, make their TikTok or Instagram posts or whatever, and that they know how to do that. And everything else is just done by magic, and they don't really care how it happens. So, um, you know, uh, helping them to see that there's other stuff that computers can do and get them into that, um, uh, that might be part of what I'm doing with, uh, with these uh, instructional videos. But yeah, just keeping on top of that. Well, Eric, one thing I appreciate about you is that you are a lifelong learner. You never lose that curiosity. And I know that rubs off on your students and your colleagues. Hey, from coast to coast, I just realized we're, we're covering Georgia, Virginia, New York, and out here on the left coast. Thank you so much for joining me for 30 minutes this morning, guys. I'll, uh, I'll make sure you have the, the link once this shows up on YouTube. But thanks for, for sharing a little bit of your day and taking a chance on me. This is a new venture. Uh, trying a little bit of live streaming, and I so appreciate your input. I'm really inspired this morning. So have a great day, guys. Take care, and we'll see you on Twitter. Oh, can, I, can I ask one more thing? Yeah, of course. Um, if you're going back to school on Monday, another thing on mindfulness, remember we lost um, Chadwick Bosman last night, the Black Panther to cancer, mm. and take a moment and acknowledge that, that people are not okay today. Yeah. I <laughs> That is that was rough. My boys were talking about that. Very sad as well. So yes, thank you for mentioning that. 
All right, everyone, take care. Get some rest and refreshment this weekend. Have a great week ahead. Take care. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye, guys.